In the late 1950s and early 1960s, steam was enjoying its Indian summer as the much-loved Stevenson locomotive gave way throughout the world to the alien diesel and electric locomotives. In Great Britain, interest in railways was on the increase, and the then novel BBC television was persuaded that there was an audience for pure railway films, and so Railway Roundabout was born. For five years, from 1958 to 1962, Patrick Whitehouse and John Adams filmed, edited and produced films about all aspects of railways, presenting 10 25-minute shows a year at 5.30 in the afternoon, ostensibly for children, but in time for many adults to tune in. The films themselves were carefully retained and are now part of our national heritage, being held in the care of the National Railway Museum at York. The programmes which form this series of five have been prepared from those original films, so we can all once again relive the great days of the Railway Roundabout. The final year of the BBC television series of Railway Roundabout was 1962. Ten programmes a year were made, consisting of a number of short features linked by professional BBC front people, the actual commentary on the film being provided by Pat and John live in the studio. The production of sufficient material for a 25-minute programme every four weeks meant that whenever possible, two or more features were filmed on one visit. This occurred in 1962, when the cameras were taken to the Isle of Wight to film the Adams Class 02 tanks, which were the mainstay of the island services from the 1920s to the end of steam in 1966. The first film was to introduce the locomotives, and was an example of routine shed visit films, which enabled a considerable number of locomotives to be seen in a short time, giving the opportunity to examine various features of the engines themselves, which accorded well with the principal interest of the show's young audience the collection of locomotive numbers, the much maligned hobby of loco spotting. The main locomotive shed on the Isle of Wight was at Wright St John's Road, where locomotive number W32 was seen being serviced. These engines were numbered in a separate series, with the prefix W, which had not changed since the early days of the Southern Railway. It was a throwback to the system used to distinguish the locomotives of the various constituent parts of the southern, when the original numbers were retained, with the addition of a letter, A for Southeastern, B for Brighton, E for Southwestern, and W for Isle of Wight. When the mainland lists were consolidated in the early 1930s, the Isle of Wight remained as it was, and the same happened in 1948, when the railways were nationalised and all mainland engines were again renumbered. This separate number series served to highlight the special nature of the island railway system. This atmosphere was gradually becoming more appreciated by railway enthusiasts in the early 1960s. As Victorian tank engines disappeared from British railways, their exclusive use on the island became the focus of much attention. They were kept in immaculate condition, and the pride of the local railwaymen was obvious. All engines were named after local towns and villages, which further heightened their interest factor. Other features distinguished the engines. All were fitted with Westinghouse air brakes, which necessitated air pumps attached to the smoke box, and large air reservoirs on the tops of the side tanks. All were of class O2, and had started life on the London and South Western Railway as light 044 tanks for lighter suburban duties and country branch lines. They were transferred to the Isle of Wight between 1923 and 1949, a total of 23 working on the system. This engine, number W28 Ashley, had been one of the 1926 transfers and worked to the end of steam on the island in 1966. The second film made on this visit was to show the extent of the island railways with their unique features. Arrival for most passengers was via the steam packet services, which operated from both Southampton and Portsmouth, the harbour station of the latter town giving a direct service to the island station at Ride Pier Head. Through bookings from London Waterloo were sold, being trained to Portsmouth, railway ship to Ride, and island steam train to resorts such as Sandown, Shanklin, Ventnor or Cowes by the island's capital Newport. Trains ran to the end of the pier at Ride, Pierhead Station, having four platforms from which we see a Ventnor-bound train departing. The engine is number W32 Bond Church, which we saw at the shed earlier. 
Pierre also boasted a tramway, operated by a pair of Drury rail cars. The incoming engine, released by the departure of the Ventnor train, followed it along the pier to ride St John's Road, which is where the island's workshops were situated, as well as the loco shed seen before, and seen again as number W25 God's Hill comes off shed. The workshops were alongside the station, on the opposite side to the loco shed, and can be seen behind the arriving engine, which is one of the last to arrive on the island in 1949, W36 Carisbrook. This engine had been transferred to work the Ventnor West branch, and was one of two that were push-pull fitted, unlike the rest of the island engines. The single white head coat disc below the chimney denoted a Ventnor line train, those for cars displaying discs over each buffer. Island engines did not have extra brackets for discs on the spoke box doors, unlike mainland engines. The Newport and Cars line diverged at Smallbrook Junction, a name every enthusiast had heard of in the 1960s. The little second box here was only open in the summer months when the railways on the island were running to capacity. Holiday traffic was the mainstay of their activities, as there was very little traffic originating on the island itself. Shanklin and Sandown were the principal holiday resorts, and some trains, such as this one, were terminated here during the summer. Shanklin was to become the terminus of the line from 1967, when electrification of the obsolete 30-row London underground tube stock replaced the O2s. With this short train ready to return, a Ventnor-bound train can come in, headed by W16 Ventnor herself. The Ojo tradition of changing the tokens takes place, and Bonchurch can return to ride. All island engines face south, there being no turntables on the island at all. Tank engines having performed all services since the railways began here in 1862. The only gradient of any note on the Isle of Wight came between Shanklin and Roxton, the only intermediate station before Ventnor. Apps Bank was two miles long, and its gradient varied from one in 190 to one in 70 at its steepest. The railway here veered inland to gain height and passed through the little town of Roxton. Originally a halt had been built here, but this had been enlarged into a full station by the Southern Railway in 1925. And the passing loop had been installed to ease traffic congestion and the traffic was heavy in the summer season. Note the number 14 over the locomotive's left-hand buffer. This was the locomotive's duty diagram, a feature used on heavy traffic days, such as summer Saturdays, when a very intensive service was operating. The departure in the southerly direction was also up a fierce gradient, at 1 in 88. Note the coaches. Part of the attraction of the island railways to the enthusiast was the vintage stock from the southern railway's constituent company. Ventnor Station was the island's southern terminus. Perched above the little Victorian seaside dug, it was set in a deep chalk cutting and was 294 feet above sea level. The cutting sides had caves carved into them, and these had served over the years as stores for the local coal merchants. All engines had to run round here and take water. There was never an engine shed at Ventnor, although stock was berthed here. The station had two platforms, although one track had two platform places. The maximum length of trains was governed by the craft site, six coaches and an engine being the limit that could be dealt with. Freight traffic was never heavy on the island, being mainly restricted to coal trains, coal being unloaded at Medina Wharf near Newport. At one stage, 060 tanks of the Brighton class E1 had worked on the island, but since 1960, the O2s reigned supreme. Ventnor lost its services at the end of 1966, when steam finally left the British Railway's island system. In the late 1950s and early 60s, the Scottish region of British Railways was very active in preservation, restoring four feed roofing locomotives in working order and their original liveries. Perhaps the most notable of these is the Jones Goods of the Highland Railway, whose claim to fame was that it was the first 460 locomotive design to work in the British Isles, the preserved engine the Highland Railway No. 103 being the first of a class of 15 engines built in 1894. 
after an unpromising start in 1958, when the Railway Roundabout team had received a brusque rebuff to their first request to film on the Scottish Reach, they built up an extremely good relationship with its management, which had resulted in many memorable features, such as two Cali Bogies to Abbey Moor, two Glens to Port William, Gordon Highlander on the Speyside Line and so on. Matt and John had it in mind to kill three birds with one stone. The Carla Blochholsch line had some of the most spectacular scenery of all railways and operated one of the last mixed passenger and freight trains in the country. These were two birds worth having. The third was the Jones Goods working on services on which it might have been familiar in its youth. The Carl line was an ex-Highland railway route and it was arranged that the engine should work for the Monday morning 615 mix from Carl one summer morning in 1960. It arrived at Carl's shed on the Saturday evening, having worked up on the 5.45 p.m. train from Inverness. On the Sunday morning, it was paraded on shed for the benefit of the cameras and cleaned up. Carl's shed, like Ventnor on the Isle of Wight, was built into a cramped site and a steep cutting. The turntable had a pit cut into the rock and the locomotive was turned here preparatory to going down to the station for some more filming. Perhaps surprisingly, the Carl turntable was a modern one, vacuum operated off the engine's braking supply. Note the swan net vacuum hose connector which hinged backwards. was, and still is, the port for the steamers to the north part of the Isle of Skye and to the Hebridean Islands. Car and foot passenger ferries whisk tourists over the few hundred yards of Skye and the railway terminus is situated right alongside the ferry jetties. The Jones goods was taken down to the station where on the Sunday morning when there were no trains, it made a number of false starts for the benefit of the camera. This mixed train consisted of a number of cattle wagons in front of a van and four coaches. Keen-eyed will notice that the train's formation seems to have changed since its departure from the Kyle. This is because the film took two years to make. On the Sunday, having made the false starts, the train reached Akna Shellac, but was stopped here. It had broken a gauge glass, so it could go no further. The next morning's train then also had to be cancelled. Since Pat and John only made the railway roundabout program as an adjunct to their normal jobs and their hobby, they could not afford the time to await it prepared. So it was over a year later in 1961 that time became available to reorganize the trip to the Western Highlands to finish the film started the previous year. It was then nearly another year before the completed film was shown on TV on the 25th of April, 1962.
Shatner Shellac marked the end of the first year's filming. This was approximately one third of the way along the route. Note the louvered chimney. This was a characteristic of all Jones' designs. A special series of four four rows were built for the Kyle of Lockholch line, known as Sky Bogies. The line passes through some spectacular scenery, from the steeply sided Loch Carron to the valley of Glen Carron. Note the goods brake van at the rear of this mixed train. The railway was fully manned and signaled despite its few trains per day, and the sparse population it served. The locomotive was painted in a striking yellow ochre colour scheme, better known as Stroudly Improved Locomotive Green, the livery in which the 460 was originally turned out for traffic. Other Stroudly features included the shape of the cap, giving these locomotives more than a passing resemblance to those of the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway. Although this was a normal service train, it was being run for the benefit of the cameras, so Pat and John had time to move their camera positions to record different angles. There were always inspectors along with special trains. The final crossing point on the line was at Garth, where the first down train of the day was encountered, a black five on a goods train. Dingwall was on time. Behind the train is the junction for the far north line to Wick and Thurso, from where a train had already arrived and was seen standing in the platform as the Jones goods entered. The opportunity was taken to look around the engine. In the background, the crew of a Black Five look on incredulously. Children were encouraged to appear in the films, as the program was essentially for children. After the engine had shunted the cattle wagons out of the way, it was brought into the platform to couple up the Black Five on the train from the far north, as it was then to double-head the train back to Inverness. As the ensemble departs, it's just possible to see a Caledonian 440 on shed at Dingwall, as the locomotives pass the camera. Assembled entirely for the benefit of cameras in the summer of 1962 was a line-up of the Midland Railway's preserved engines, which were kept at Derby at this time. The event was the result of a decision to take official photographs of Curtly 240 number 158A, the working 440 compound number 1000, the last surviving Tilbury tank for Thunderstate, and the Johnson single driver, or spinner, number 118. 
after they'd been photographed in Garvey's yard, the compound shunted them to prepare for a journey to Worksworth, the branch terminus always having been used as the official photographic location for the Midland Railway. The final locomotive in the lineup was the spinner. These single driving axle locomotives were an anachronistic product of Midland design practice in the late 19th century. As trains had grown heavier and technology had improved, the small single driver had been phased out on almost all railways. However, there was still a school of thought that a single driving axle could produce greater speed as coupling rods might restrict the freedom of the wheels to rotate at higher speeds, justified to some extent at the time when tolerances were not as tight as they became later. This fear was normally outweighed by the advantage in addition that could be obtained by having the power transmitted through more than one axle and the improved starting ability made up any time lost through lower top speeds. The invention of steam sanding had given the single driver a new lease of life as it meant that starting addition could be improved whilst retaining the freedom of movement at high speeds. At Duffield's junction for the Worksworth branch, Pat Whitehouse signed his autograph for young enthusiasts and railway roundabout viewers. The train then set off down the branch with the compound leading as before. The first and last engines in the cavalcade represented the two final generations of Midland Express locomotives. The Midland Railway became the leading advocate of single drivers and the Johnson singles had a brief reign as the top express power in the 1890s. This fitted in well with the Midlands policy of short, frequent and fast trains. However, even the Midlands stock grew heavier and the spinners were soon outclassed, being phased out in the first decade of the 20th century, replaced by the compounds and the smaller 440s. Most went then and all had gone by the First World War, except number 118 retained for preservation, one of the earliest examples of a railway preserving its locomotives. The Johnson single was a later design than the small 240 number 158A, which was built to the order of his predecessor Matthew Kirtley. These little engines were quite up with practice on other railways when they were introduced in the 1860s and 1870s. The other engine in green memory was not of Midland origin, but was the product of a Midland subsidiary, the London, Tilbury and South End Railway. This was an outer London commuter railway, on which a series of 442 tank engine designs had operated all services since the 1890s. The preserved engine Thunderstick was one of the second series, built in 1909. Replaced on their native metals in the 1930s by larger Stanier designs, they'd found a useful role on former Midland branches until the 1950s when all were withdrawn, with the exception of number 80, which was restored in 1956 to take part in the LTSR centenary celebration. That was the only time she ever steamed after preservation. News of the presence of the television cameras had got out of Worksworth and the local school children were allowed along to the station to see both the locomotives and the filming. Nothing changes. Hey, Mum, look at me. I'm on the telly. The locomotives were lined up alongside the platform for the children to examine, the station still being in existence despite having closed to passengers as early as the 1st of January 1947, a year before nationalisation. The locomotives were then shunted into the yard for the photographic session. Of course, the sun went in then. However, after waiting patiently, it returned to give this magnificent lineup for the official photographers. The private preservation scheme was still in its infancy in 1962 whilst the Welsh narrow-gauge preservation projects had been the flavour of the 1950s, the 60s were to see standard-gauge lines taking prominence. The first of these were the Middleton Railway in Leeds, an industrial line, and the Bluebell Railway in rural Sussex, a full passenger route which British railways had closed in the 1950s. 
Pat Whitehouse and John Adams visited the Bluebell in 1961 and 62 to record its early days, starting at its southern limit, Sheffield Park. The railway had started its locomotive collection with a number of small ex-southern region tank engines. To each of the Stroudley Terriers, or routers, of class A1X, and the Southeastern and Chatham P-class 060 Dock Shunters. Stepney was one of the Terriers, a class with a complicated and fascinating history. The engines were very powerful in spite of their diminutive size, and had survived in quite large numbers until the 1950s. They became very popular locomotives for preservationists. The latest arrival at this time was the Adams Radial Tank number 488. It had been withdrawn from its famous duties on the Lyme Regis branch on the 9th of July 1961 and dispatched to the Bluebell, who at first ran it in its British Railway's line black livery, with crest removed and its original London and South Western Railway number 488 on the bunker sides. railway preservation, a lot of lessons were being learned. Since British Railways still ran steam in everyday service and its stations and infrastructure hadn't changed a great deal since the beginning of the century, emphasis was on the preservation of the pre-grouping scene. It was also of importance to establish an individual identity for the railway, and to this end the locomotives were not necessarily painted in authentic liveries. Somewhat inevitably, this little southeastern and Chatham Railway dock tank became the line's mascot as it was painted blue and named after the railway. It had been built as SECR number 323 in 1910 to the designs of Harry Wainwright as a member of a class of eight small engines originally to work light auto trains as part of the railway's response to early bus competition. Many railways had built self-contained steam rail cars as the answer to buses, including the SECR, but these had not proved successful, leaving to the provision of very small tank engines working with push-pull fitted stock. Unfortunately, these were little more successful, and the 8 P-class engines were relegated to pilot duties and dock shunting after a short while on their intended duties. The overhanging edges of the cab roof, known as the pagoda roof, were designed to allow drivers on suburban passenger duties to look out in foul weather with some protection, and this also proved a comfort for drivers on shunting duties. Enamel metal signs were still available from closed British Railway stations. In an age when advertising is seen as a 15-second blip on our television screens, it's interesting to observe how much longer product life cycles were in another age. Those enamel signs lasted for decades, some for over half a century, and they bring back a sense of permanence, which was in tune with the perception of railways before the 1960s. The preservation movement was the product of a realization that railways were not permanent, and there was a certain feeling that it was already too late. But the Bluebell was in time to rescue a wide variety of Victorian relics just before the infamous beaching axe was wielded. The rundown and closure of the Bluebell and its subsequent preservation had been a long drawn out affair. If British Railways had had their way, it would have been completely torn up and scrapped long before anyone thought of preserving it. It was a through route from East Grinstead to Lewis, used as an alternative route to the main Brighton line on occasions. But in 1955, VR closed it, as it duplicated two other routes. However, clauses in the original agreement between the operating railway and its owners guaranteed certain stations a minimum of four trains a day. And in 1956, local residents forced VR to reopen the line with the four train service. This VR did, calling at only the stations mentioned in the agreement whilst obtaining special parliamentary powers to close the line, which took place again from the 17th of March, 1958. The delay, however, had aroused the interest of enthusiasts, and the Bluebell Railway purchased the section from Sheffield Park to Horsted Keynes in 1960. Horsted Keynes was still used by British Railways, 
as it was a junction station for an electrified branch to Haywards Heath, over which a number of through train specials were run in the early days. This is the stock of the Blue Bell, coming onto BR medals in 1962, when the Adams tank had been repainted into its Adams pea green livery. The engine at the other end was another preservation first, as it was the first privately purchased standard gauge mainline locomotive, the Great Northern Class J52060 tank, bought by Captain Bill Smith from the Eastern Region in 1959. It had brought the special down from London on the Brighton Main Line and had come to the Bluebell, over which it worked on the 1st of April 1962. The Adams tank attracted much interest, as it had a long and interesting career. It was built for the LSWR, sold to the Ministry of Munitions in the First World War, resold to the East Kent Railway after the war, and reacquired by the LSWR successor, the Southern Railway in 1946, for use on the Lyme Regis branch. Its final days there were recorded in railway roundabout in 1960, so it was interesting for viewers to see it again in its preserved state. The through train used standard British Railway stock, and it stood by whilst an electric train came in from Haywards Heath. This branch was to close on the 28th of October 1963, leaving the Bluebell isolated. It was to be near the turn of the century before the Bluebell was to have any hope of a BR connection once again, as in the 1990s, an extension scheme to rebuild the line back to East Grinstead was inaugurated. During this period, the Hooker Keith remained BR property. Bluebell's line had stopping short of the station. Access was permitted over BR metal, but this didn't allow any running round, which is why trains had locomotives at each end. After the closure of the electric branch, the railway had full access and control of Horses Keen. The regular service train left before the special. One of the best known expresses on British Railway's western region was the Cambrian Coast Express, which served the former Cambrian Line stations to the west of Shrewsbury. The train started at Paddington, usually behind one of the region's castle-class locomotives, and it was here that Pat Whitehouse and John Adams started their record of this famous train in the last year of railway roundabout, and in the dying days of steam, as diesel hydraulic locomotives were rapidly ousting the castles and kings from their toppling duties by now. Locomotives were no longer kept in immaculate condition in the London area, although the filthy appearance of steam engines in the last years had not yet happened. By this time also, the famous chocolate and cream coaching sets of the late 50s, which had graced the named expresses, had been broken up on the orders of the new general manager, Mr. Raymond. The film was the product of many days shooting. Different engines were seen along the route, which took the direct Great Western line through Vista to Banbury, where a connection existed with the Great Central. This castle, number 7017, was named after the Great Western's famous locomotive engineer, G.J. Churchward. Unusually, the Cambrian Coast Express had a hall class mixed traffic engine on it on one occasion, and later a king, number 6019, King Henry V. The route of the Cambrian Coast Express took it through Birmingham and Wolverhampton to Shrewsbury's joint station. Waiting outside the station would be a manor-class locomotive of Aberystwyth Shed. Unlike the London Shed, pride still ruled at the Welsh Coastal Resort, and Barcote Manor was immaculate. She was being held alongside the triangle of lines to the south of the station, where her driver, a man of great experience, 
was oiling round preparatory to running back onto the train after its arrival from London. Note the storm sheet on the back of the cab. Great Western engines never had fully enclosed cabs, unlike those of the other mainline railways and British railways. The train arrived from the Wolverhampton direction behind another castle. Two visits were made here to film the sequence that followed the arrival of the train. Barcote Manor had seen alongside the train and then backing down onto the stock in the platform. On the second occasion, a different castle heads the train in, with a former LNER coach at the head. This time, Barcote Manor ran in from the sidings to the west of the triangle. She wasn't quite so pulled up, with her buffers showing signs of use. Shrewsbury's lofty signal box, still in use at the beginning of the 1990s, the road was set for the departing CCE. Pat Whitehouse was able to use its height to advantage here as the manor pulled out. The Cambrian main line made a number of junctions on its way to the coast. At Moat Lane, the Midwells line came in from Brecon and Tuttleflin Junction. This line closed at the end of this year, 1962. A large engine shed was sighted here behind the platform. Pat had followed the train here, the engine's condition being normal for the train and not especially prepared for the cameras. The most important intermediate station was at the country where the train was split into two halves. The arriving engine would take the first half onwards to its home base at Aberystwyth. local shunting that took place before the rear portion of the train set off behind a standard class 3 tank engine, heading for the northern part of the Cambrian coast route via Barmouth Bridge. The same train is seen passing Abadavi Golf Course as it moves away from the Dovey Estuary to run along the coastal route to Barmouth. The main train terminated at Aberystwyth, where another manor is seen drawing to a halt. 
This 30-strong class of lightweight 460s was a familiar sight on Cambrian lines for 25 years, having worked alongside the famous double-frame Duke dogs, which we saw in 1960. Many of them survive today, and they're popular preserved engines. One Hinton Manor ran to Aberystwyth again in 1987 and 1991 with steam specials, harking back to the great days of the Cambrian Coast Express. In many ways, the Railway Roundabout series was the progenitor of today's railway video magazines and its mixture of films recording various facets of railway operation, from special trains, preserved railways, modern traction, and visits to the more celebrated railway institutions, such as Swindon Works, the spiritual home of so many great Western enthusiasts. On this occasion, one of Swindon's last built express steam engines, Penrith Castle, was displayed to the cameras having recently been shot. She was one of the last to be built of this famous class in June 1949 and was fitted with her double chimney in May 1958. On the turntable is an engine with a Great Western name, but not a Great Western pedigree. For some time, the Western had been allocated a batch of British Railways Class 7 Pacifics, or Britannias. Many were named after the original Great Western Star Class 460s, which had finally gone in the 1950s. This was the most appropriately named one for the region, although the men didn't really think Britannia should be the Western Star locomotive. The engine was one of those which had had its original smoke deflector handrails replaced by handholds, following an accident with one of the class blamed on poor visibility caused by the deflectors, a feature not seen on native Great Western engines. The enemy was within. Swindon was also home to the warship diesel hydraulic class, which was to supplant the Britannias and Castles on the top expresses. By 1962, this was well underway. The hydraulics didn't last long, all being swept away in the 1970s in the interest of standardization on British railways. They'd represented the last flowering of Swindon's independence. These scenes epitomize the way the railway roundabout team took stock footage to make up a film for later release, as many of these scenes were taken in the early days of the program and not shown until later. This class 4700 is undergoing overhaul and is not being dismantled. Swindon's 2000th built locomotive was City of Truro and famous 100 mile an hour 440 double framer, which had been restored to working order in 1957. Here she's seen outside her birthplace as locomotives of a different era speed past. An immaculate diesel shunter brings out an equally immaculate shunter of the previous era. This is one of the ubiquitous pannier tanks of the 5700 class. 4695 was one of the post-war built engines, originally emerging from these workshops in 1945. Height and width were critical for rolling stock and locomotives, and the setting of springs was an art at Swindon. A special loading gauge was used to ensure that engines would not leave the works and then hit a bridge. Not to be moved, read the plate at the back of a London suburban tank, number 6116, seen at Swindon on an earlier occasion. This was the final flowering of a long line of large prairies, the class having a higher boiler pressure than its similar sisters. 
All 70 were originally used on outer suburban work, and one, number 6106, can still be seen today. The notice was very necessary, as it was a warning that men were working on the engine, adjusting the motion. Once the work was completed, the engine could go off shed to return to her duties. Our final visit to the world of the railway roundabout takes us to the southern regions west of England main line at Seaton Junction, where Bully Pacific still ruled the roost on main line express. This was the last 100 cent steam main line in Great Britain, and was still under southern region control and unchanged since its heyday of the 1950s. The station was purely a junction, a branch to Seaton, operated by a pushful fitted class M7044 tanks being its raison d'etre. The main line trains made connections here, and it was laid out with four lines to enable non-stop expresses to pass stopping trains. A milk depot was situated at the junction, its only other source of income. Arriving off the Seaton branch on a summer Saturday is the branch push-pull train. In the opposite direction, the train arrives on the down through line behind the bullet Battle of Britain Pacific. This is the summer of Saturday's only through train to Seaton from Waterloo. Another M7 stands at the up platform. The branch train moves out of the branch platform to clear the road for the through train. 30048 will move across once the line is clear to prepare for the coaches of the through train to be backed onto the branch. The Bullet Pacific is uncoupled and moves off while the train is taken on its way to Seaton, a short distance of two miles or so by the M7. Once the road is clear, the branch train re-enters the platform. Seaton Station had two platform places, so the branch could handle two trains at once. Pacific had to await a path to carry on to Exeter, as there was no turntable at Seaton Junction. The engine was temporarily stabled in the sidings alongside the Seaton branch platform. Almost as common as the Bullet Pacific on this line were Maulsell's S15 class 460s mixed traffic design that saw as much passenger use as freight. The Salisbury Shed had a number of them used on local trains. Another of the S-15s illustrates the method by which the engines of the through trains would get on to Exeter. After the train had gone on to Sydney, another local train would fall at Sydney Junction. The through train locomotive would then set forward double head the local train on the west, giving it valuable assistance up on the bank as a bonus. Note the large vacuum reservoirs on the top of the tender. This was a southern locomotive characteristic. The southern allocation of BR standard class 5s was also active on the West of England line, and an unwelcome sight was a diverted water on a Paddington Express. Two years later, these diesels would take over all duties on this line, and in four years, Seaton Junction itself would be closed. Back on the branch, the M7 Hall through train returns to the junction, with the Pacific still awaiting a return path.
We now see the procedure for the train going back to London. In this instance, the train, complete with a buffy car, is taken out onto the main line and added to the rear of an up express which calls at the station. This was common procedure on the southern lines of the West Country, with multi-portion trains picking up and setting down at obscure country junctions. On summer Saturdays, Waterloo received and sent through trains and coaches to virtually every small resort on the system. Those days are gone forever. Nineteen sixty two was the end of regular railway roundabout programs, but a regular feature was a can you guess spot, which showed scenes from previously shown films as a competition. A number of these follow. Can you guess where they are? We saw an important express come in here from the carriage sidings. Here are some more views. A roadside line in which country? This class of engine was used for banking trains. These views show its rather interesting condensing gear. Where did we see these engines on banking duties? The next shot should help you decide as its replacements thunder up what bank? This is a Midland 2F. We saw them twice. What was the station at the foot of two banks? <laughs> 